Fire Radio. What I was getting at is um, what I love, what I get to do with the platform uh, is that I get to put on whoever I want. And, like, a lot of the guys that make that are on the circuit, that teach all over the country, that do conferences, that are on different podcasts, they're on – it's the same – stuff all the time and there's nothing I'm not faulting that like that is not what I'm I value those guys I value like I had John Norman on the show right and like like yeah. just sitting there with him and talking right. with him was a highlight of my fire service career that I got Absolutely. to do that right but other people have heard his stories and 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 so on and other guys you know all the big names right and I can interview all these guys I think right I've interviewed a lot of them but for me I really enjoy the side of the of National Fire Radio where I can just interview Joe Average dude from somewhere who's yep. got something to share and yep. he's got incredible passion. And here's the thing. It's like Donovan was on the other day and that's how we got on this. Donovan to me was like he's a I think he could be a rising star. I think he's a guy that has a huge heart, a great smile, good laughter, and I think he I think if if he stays with it and surrounds himself with great people, there's an ability that in 20 years from now, he'll be one of those guys that is making the rounds. And, and I love that because I love finding the next guys. Like, that to me is super important because the guys that have been there and done that, as much as they've been there and done that and, and, and their stories matter and their experience matters and all that stuff, we need to start promoting the next generation too. And, and there's no, no doubt. And what – Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you're seeing these people on the circuit, as you put it, which is, a, I think, the right way to look at it, but also on the podcast, people that are get the national level attention, which is great. Kudos to them if they have a message to say. But they're being very, very easily classed into two different types. You've got your Mickey Farrells, which is not just talking about stretching a hose line, cutting a hole in the roof. He's into the the psychological portion of it. He's into the mechanics, the workflow aspects, all of those things that, that really tie a company together that have skill sets. And then the other half of the house is reinforcing skill sets. Uh, you know, this line placement, how to, you know, it, you know, uh, Rowlett from Mobile, it, he's doing, you know, from hose beds to bundles, you know, and all that. Great message, great topic, but you've got a very small segment, the Mickey Farrell segment, as I would call it, with everybody else that's teaching the hands-on, you know, didactic stretching hose and breaking a sweat stuff. And the one part that we don't have is something that ties those two together. And what we have is that we've got a we have got a hungry generation that is starving for good information. They're looking to that senior role, your Mike Dugans, your you know, you know, Ray McCormick's, all those guys, the John Normans. But at some point, and I don't mean this critically, they're gonna time out. They're going to have to have something in between between the senior, super well-known, yes. respected guys and the young guys. And what we're not tying together, the Mickey Farrells and, and the hands-on stuff, is how do you evolve from being that go get them fireman that has a helmet cam and wants to burn their stuff off their back and get in there and do it? And how do you then make that next step to company officer to where you tame that, you focus it, and you throttle it to when it's appropriate – I don't think that there's enough of teaching people how to be company officers as much as we're teaching philosophy, which is relevant, and we're teaching skill sets, but there's not anything in between. And I think that that's really lacking right now. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think a lot of that, too, comes from where we are today in society where, and I've talked about this at length, where we have more people starving for leadership books and podcasts on how to be a good leader instead of doing it the old-fashioned way of putting in the time to learn it yourself. Yeah. Like, you can be mentored, and you can watch teaching styles and discipline styles and, and, and cool-headedness or whatever you want to learn while you sit back and watch those before you, your mentors, your company officers, those senior guys. That's an important part of the process. We can't quicken the process to be a better leader. We can read and listen to podcasts, read books, that will help you, but you still have to do it. It's like firefighting, right? If you've never, yeah. if, you know, cliche, if you've never gone down that hallway, but you've read about it and right. you feel like you can do it, you don't know until that heat drives you to your belly and you don't know that you got two more door frames to make and you don't know what that feels like until you actually do it. 
Best example of that is that in Houston, we used to always hear, oh, Southwest Houston, we have all the multiples. Y'all can't put fires out, this, that, and the other. Uh, all we made were apartment fires 90% of the time. And when you pull up, if you got four units going, you don't apply house fire tactics to an apartment fire. So we used to always kid around, and they used to say, it's just an apartment. Go deal with it. But they're used to garden apartments. Make a center hallway apartment where you're on air 100 feet from the apartment, 150 feet from the apartment. And so, yeah, it's one of those things where a topic and, and the casual overlay of, of labeling it is doesn't transcend to what it actually is. And, and so I use garden apartments and, you know, center hallways, two different things. You treat a center hallway apartment like a hotel because it is. Multiple occupied spaces. You're on air. You've got a contaminated environment because the door is always open. And God forbid you lose a window or a sliding glass door. Then you've got a blowtorch event, you know, and then you wind up like uh, FDNY had, you know, uh, in Vendalia uh, when the three members of the truck got, got caught up in a blowtorch uh, on an upper floor. And it's one of those things where center hallways and apartments, I've just used that as an example of where, you know, you can say you can do it. You went to the fire academy. How many people in our fire academy classes were the biggest and baddest until they had to go through that door for the first time? And, and I kid you not, how many of them had, I have an air pack problem. When you got to go through the door for the first time. You're right. Everybody, it, it's one of the things that, that I'm a big believer in. It's actually one of my tattoos. It, and I firmly believe in it. You know, leadership is about results, not attributes. And unfortunately, in today's society, and the fire service is not exempt, we put way too much stock on attributes. These people have the right characteristics. They have the right traits. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't translate into results, it's ineffective. You know, I'd rather have a guy who doesn't have a college degree that barely got out of high school, but he knows how to lead people into combat, pardon the term, than somebody who has two degrees hanging on his wall and at the end of the day, doesn't know how to manage his desk, let alone, you know, three other people going down the hallway with him. But I think we can have both. And, 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 this, is, and this is where, like, for me, what, what I think is super important is what do we value in people to know the type of people we need? Because this is not for everyone. Right. Right? And, and one of my favorite quotes is Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yep. Whether you have college degrees or you're an auto mechanic with grease up to your elbows and then you came into the fire service, either guy or girl can have a foundation that we can build upon, but we need to make sure that the core values of what the expectations are of the fire service cannot be neglected. Right. We have to have core foundational values that we can't lower the bar on. And we can educate a lot of pe we can educate people if people are willing to be educated. It's how we reach them, how we connect them, how we get to them. Understanding that the auto mechanic learns differently than the guy with two degrees on the wall. Do we have a system in place today in today's fire service that understands that, sees the change in dynamics, and instead of vilifying it, are we building out programs to be able to reach each type of person? It's become more of an individual learning experience today than, than this is the way we teach it. You better get on board. It just, go ahead. No, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think you can have both. And I think that you do have to find that. You know, you've taken the same management classes I have where they talk about there's essentially 10 different types of personalities and you have to find a different way to reach the different personality sets to get them to buy into whatever the vision is to move in the same direction, all the rest of that. But... It's just like right now, if you and I own 10 acres of land next to each other, you hit oil and oil is what's going right now. It doesn't matter if I have lithium on my property. At the end of the day, you have to work with, with what you have to work with. And to your point about do we make it do it our way, you have to have a baseline capability, desire, and willingness to work to be something that can be cultivated into somebody that is usable on a fire truck serving the community. And when I say usable... Not just physically, you know, that old saying, you know, uh, weak mind, strong back or, or however it goes, you know, right. we all know guys like that and girls, but when you get down to it, you know, you ha today's fire service requires a thinker. Uh, the technology that we use just in an apparatus, heck, just in the office is light years ahead of where it was, you know, when Captain Dugan uh, came on the job, you know, no more paper, everything's electronic. So you have to have that 
technological savviness, if you will, and the generation that's coming up now has that. Where they suffer is that they don't have conflict resolution skills, they don't have interpersonal skills, and they don't have the ability to work through problems without it escalating into an HR matter. Uh, and so that's a generational issue. Uh, I firmly believe you could take anybody of any cross-section demographic in the country and put them on the same fire truck. If they're from the same generation, not a problem. Today's problems will, are, are typically generational differences. You have different beliefs. You have different expectations. You and Donovan talked about standards and expectations, how sometimes those are mutually exclusive, sometimes they aren't. And when you get down to it, standards, to me, should be driven by what the expectations are. But there's two levels of expectations, internal to the organization and the community that we serve. So your standards have to split that hair and you have to be able to meet both of the sets of expectations. And if you can dial the standards up to do that, great. If you have to dial them down to do that, but still maintain a standard, there's something, you know, and that's another conversation. But an organization has to have standards. Otherwise, hose beds look like crap. Stations don't get clean. Training doesn't get done. Policies aren't adhered to. You know, you, you've got a multitude of things. And whether we like it or not, and some people will say it's not how it used to be, the fire service is still a paramilitary organization. There's still a hierarchy. There's still a rank structure. That's right. But it's being eroded. It's mm. being eroded generationally. Because even new, new uh, younger generations that are promoting up right now, if you will find that based upon who they came up around directly drives how they are. Which means that it's situational, it's experience-based, it's them coming up around hard asses or people that have a certain level of expectation above and beyond that of the organization, or you have those that come up through an organization where they have to find their own way or they under office okay. like that. Well, let's let's break that down a little bit because you know a lot of this is young generation, young generation, young generation. But I'm looking at the older guys. I think are are culpable as well, and I, I think that you know they they you know there's a inherently across the system young and old there's a disconnect there's no doubt mm -hmm. you said something that piqued my interest i want to explore it for a couple of minutes with you before i get back to that point yeah. you said if everybody from the same generation is on the same apparatus there's no problems fewer it was probably a better way to Few, put it. okay fewer problems yeah. right yeah. good thank you for correcting because you're right fewer problems why mm -hmm. why because they have similar upbringing societal impacts on their personal lives were the same uh all of the extraneous, you know, outside factors in our daily lives were the same and shared. You know, whether it was the political mood, whether it was the economy, whether it was whatever, you had similar external factors that formed them in, into who they are. Where versus so, now, you, you put that outlier younger generation on there. Okay, but my, my, my point now, though, right, is in the fire service, adversity makes us better. I think that I, I maybe, I mean, we can argue that, I guess, but I'm looking at it this way. I become better by being surrounded by different people. I want to be challenged. Yep. I want to be challenged. I want to be educated. Mm -hmm. I want to be pushed, encouraged, beaten, picked back up. That all comes through different people. I mean, shit, I'm friends with you. I don't know why. Right. But I think when I come away from the conversation with you, I just feel better about myself. I don't know. As but, you should. <laughs> my point, though, right, is like I, I think about a, an apparatus of four people. They all come from the same generation. I think it can I think it can get to a place of complacency. I think we need different people from different walks of life to work together to challenge one another. The question is, is what does that look like? What's the yeah. what's the equation? How what's the magic, right? And the magic the magic is what's missing. Okay. I well, think go ahead. To your point, if I can, mm. that four people on a fire truck from the same generation, yeah. there's one common thing that they all typically have in common. Work ethic. They okay. got into the fire service back when it was still treated as it is, a blue collar job. There were bums in the seventies too. Right. <laughs> right. But you had a work ethic, and there was you, – we've all had the same percentage. just depends on the numbers based on the size of your organization. But I think that that generation had a 
the older generation. I'm not going to go back to World War II, but you, you've got that generation. There was a work ethic thing, and again, it's those external factors that form those generations into who they are. And you ask the question of how do you bridge that gap? Well, if you've got that young new generation person on the back of the apparatus, how do you bridge the gap? It goes back to what I said a minute ago. It's, it's exactly what you said you want. You want to be challenged. You want to be broken down. You want to have adversity. But at the same time, too, you want it to be educational, and you want them to understand that at the end of the road, A, there is an end, and B, you'll be better off for it. It takes being in those firehouses. It takes being around those old heads that are not checked out. And so it's a balancing act. It's not just balancing the new generation. It's balancing the old heads. I learned more from a a 30-year pipeman than I could ever learn from a four-year captain because he had been there and done that, but he wasn't jaded to the officer hierarchy or anything else. He was just a down and dirty. Matter of fact, we're all having dinner tonight uh, to where I, I learned so much from him of how to handle yourself, how to carry yourself, when to run your mouth, when not to, you know, how to put in work, how to walk away, how to bring it up when somebody isn't pulling their load, you know. So when I became that senior guy and I had to have those conversations when the engine company captain looked at me and I said, I'll handle it, he didn't have to say a word. I knew what his facial expression meant. I got the guys together on the tailboard and said, not again. This is the deal, X, Y, and Z. But you learn so, that by exposure and by immersion. Yes, but not everybody's going to have that experience anymore, right? And, and I understand completely. I mean, I do a program called Bridging the Gap, and I talk oh. about the generational differences and the upbringings and the socioeconomical influences and all these things, yeah. the, the difference in education and upbringing and so on. But we have, and I know by you, not so much by me, what's, what's happening in the Northeast is you're finding a lot of the volunteer fire companies that were rooted for hundreds of years are starting to fold up and starting to bring in per diem guys because they can't handle the increase in call volume and increase in responsibility with dwindling volunteers. So we're seeing a changeover here in the Northeast that volunteer departments are starting to look at the career structure. Mm-hmm. That's the changeover for us in the Northeast, but there's still a lot of rooted tradition and culture here over 100 years in most firehouses, right? Down by you, there's an explosive growth of ESDs and districts that I've gotten to know where they're building firehouses one on top of another because communities are just popping up overnight, and these districts are growing and growing. And so now there's a look at you know growing the fire service to scale with the community. Great. Now you're you're gonna have a fire engine full of people from the same generation yeah. together. Well, there's another phenomenon going on down here, uh, yeah. where you have guys that are popping smoke in San Antonio or Austin or Houston. What does that mean? Retiring and they're leaving. Oh, po- okay. And what they do as soon as they pop smoke and they're out, they've already got another job lined up at one yeah. of the other places. Uh, so where you are starting to get some of that transfer of knowledge and experience. They're just wearing a different patch on their shirt. So okay. that is happening some, especially north of Houston into Montgomery County. You've got a lot of Houston guys that are retiring. And the organizations they're going to work for are actively recruiting them because they know they'll be better for it. Because they're, they're, they're literally turnkey bringing in people with 20-plus years of experience that have been there, done that. But they're also doing it carefully to make sure that they're bringing in the right personalities with the right vision and understanding. And they're being successful with it. Uh, and so y'all have y'all are taking the step from volunteer to looking at a career structure, as you put it. We're down here. We're we're resorting to infighting, uh, for for lack of a better term. Between well, that's years. yeah, and you and I kind of talked about that, right? So cities and cities. I mean, yeah, everything down here. Again, back to generational. You know, and again, I'm not to, to say that the new generation only cares about money, but it is an an increasingly driving factor. And ESDs have a distinct advantage over cities because an ESD's whole purpose is to fund a fire department and possibly EMS. ESD, just so people, I mean, people listen from all over. So ESD is Emergency Service District, right? Is that what, yeah, it, is yeah. that what it is? Yes. And, and that's, that's a, a, a tax, just explain the, the difference between a municipality and an ESD. Uh, an ESD, it, it, I'll take one that was just formed in our county. Uh, basically, it goes a referendum vote of the citizens to where the ESD would be formed and they would have an ad valorem tax of up to 10 cents per $100 valuation on their property. That is used exclusively uh, for the provision of fire and EMS. 
Uh, okay. Nothing else by, by state statute. But then the county commissioners appoint an ESD board, and they are the overseers. And then the ESD board, much like a city council, they can determine who their service provider is. They can either contract with an existing volunteer fire department or fire department, or they can elect to create their own and hire employees directly. So you can have ESD uh, firefighters, and you can have contract firefighters that work for an ESD. So it gets kind of confusing at times. But to my, my point was is that ESDs only have to fight with themselves over their tax revenue to provide yeah. services. Right. Cities, as a fire chief, I have to go up against the police chief, public works director. Yeah, right. Everybody. Um, that's right. For a piece of the pie. And so that's where you're starting to see it now. And the cities are finding it hard uh, to stay competitive from a salary perspective. ESDs are doing ridiculous salaries. They're doing 100% employees uh, for insurance, just like cities are. But then some of them are doing 100% for family. Some of yeah. them have taken the two to one pension contribution and gone three to one. I mean, mm. it's absolutely insane what's taking place in some of these places. And as a city fireman my whole life, call it envy, call it jealousy. But at the end of the day, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where you're sitting there going, how do we keep up? Well, and so you said the word before competition, oh, yeah. because what I what I'm finding and what I'm hearing in a lot of conversations and, and, and you know, rooms of, of conversation and chatter that I'm in. A lot of it comes down to now fire departments or firefighters today, and I've been saying this a long time, have more opportunity than ever before. And, and it's not just for training or exposure. It's also for their job. Ooh. Like we're, we're vilifying – a lot of times we're vilifying the, the kids that are coming in and the guys are leaving. And I got roasted on social media the other day for making a comment about lateral transfers and if people leave – and then they want to come back, I was like, no way, man. You left my team. I don't want you back, right? right? Like, there's a sense of loyalty. And people, I think, didn't understand the context of the conversation, so I got roasted on that. <laughs> but my point is this, right? And that's fine. I, I Listen, I put my foot in my mouth all the time. But I firmly believe that, too. I still think there needs to be a sense of loyalty. The problem becomes, now more than ever, it's more about the individual. So it's family, children, spouses, income, experience, all those things now for the individual. And where never before, Larry, when you were a fireman in Houston 25 years ago, you didn't have opportunity. You could have worked maybe. Well, yeah, you are. I just but my point years ago. But okay. I know. But how many years did you do? 27. Do the math, will you? Okay. Thank you. And my, my point is, though, is the amount, the abundance of jobs or opportunities didn't exist then that do today. Ooh. And now when you look at the opportunities today and all of a sudden these fire departments are offering better pay, better structure, better condition of life, better this, better that, fire departments are now competing with one another for lateral transfers because, hey, if I can grab a guy from a city that's already got training and experience and bring him over across the floor, two weeks orientation, he's, he's operating the front line. He's ready to go. And laterals are picking up big time in Texas, not just yes. fire, but law enforcement also. Uh, yes. Our police department is offering laterals. We just started with our step program that we implemented this year, uh, step compensation program. We're offering laterals. Uh, a fireman for us has a 10 step program. We'll lateral them in all the way up to the halfway point. You know, one step for each year of documented service. And if they bring a skill set with them, we'll pay them as well as we can for individual certifications. I mean, we're constantly looking at, and how that's what I was doing all morning was trying to figure out how to uh, improve our, our compensation package uh, for FY25. And it's absolutely insane. Uh, I remember when our starting full time fireman and staffer started at 46. They're right. at 64 now, and we're looking to put that in the rearview mirror. You know, right. and then you look at some departments in the Houston area, they're in the 50s. It's all over the place, but it's you don't have one outlier or very rarely have one. 70 plus thousand dollar starting fireman pay without everybody around them being in the same right because they all draw from the same that's right and well they got to compete with one another exactly so in fort Bend county where we are we have a city next to us that is just we, we're waiting for their next salary adjustment to come out because we know it's coming and it's gonna kill everybody which you know oh, okay you know who you know who wins the fireman wins absolutely but to your point about loyalty this organization wow. up to now never did uh, uh, laterals. Uh, and if you're civil service, you can't do laterals. Uh, that's entry level only, all the way up through the promotions and the different divisions right. based upon the organization. 
And so you run into that quagmire, which automatically throws out some competition, but it doesn't remove the ESDs. And with everybody in our area going to a 4896, people are willing to drive further to get to work. So you're right. just recruiting from your county or adjacent county. I had a person that worked for me that lived in Fort Worth. And she drove down five hours to go to work and work her 48 and went back home for four days. Very good person, good firefighter. But she Why why wouldn't you? Exactly. Yeah. So that just helps accelerate even more that you don't have to look, okay, I want to work someplace within an hour's drive. No. I can, you know, I I know Houston firemen, and they'll probably shred me for saying this. I know Houston firemen that lived in Las Vegas, you know, lived everywhere. Sure. Because it's nothing but an airplane, an airport, and, you know, I've got five days off. All is well. And so I think you're seeing a, a that's not generational. That's just the evolution of the fire service and to where I, I think you're going to see that continue in probably what is, extreme ways. But, but what does that do to the job? Oh, it erodes it. It's no longer the center of focus. You know, I've heard right? you say it. I know a lot of the people that I hang around with have said it. You know, there's a job and there's a career. There's a lifestyle and there's something you get paid to do. And unfortunately, that crack is getting bigger. And you're not going to have, you know, I, I remember in Houston when I was a rookie, you'd have off-duty guys stopping by the station all the time. Drink a glass of tea, see what's going on. When I retired, you didn't have off-duty people stopping by the station because it's the evolution of the fire service. First of all, call volume's through the roof now compared to yeah. what it was. You know, even yes. in our small community, you know, we're, we went from 900 runs to 5,000 runs, you know, and it's just really. And so I think that sense of community that sense of this is my being uh, and everything that, that I'm about and that I want to be about and surround myself with, it's starting to erode because of other things where convenience and possibilities intersect to cause people to live further away, to do shift swaps, and they're not at work for two weeks, you know, and, and, and a lot of other things, you know, that it, it's just, it's manageable. We just have to have a different understanding of what the fire service is going well, forward. I don't. I don't want to come off as this, like, idealistic type of guy. I worry about the core foundation of what the fire service stands for, and I get that it's changing. I mean, listen, I'm not a career fireman, so I can't speak to that, right? But I can tell you that I am, you know, 30 years in the fire service. I am in love with it, and I'm looking at my little slice of the fire service is changing dramatically too. So it's across the board, right? But my, my point is this is the fire service is built on some core foundational things that many of old, many of old timers believe in and it is changing and what i worry about is when firefighting becomes less of a lifestyle or a way of being and more about the individual when called upon to act is that going to interfere with your decisions i i totally understand that terrifies the shit out of me because yeah. we have a public that unconditionally believes that we will be there whether it's picking grandma off the floor a water leak a carbon monoxide alarm or a structural fire we will be there unconditionally and when called upon to do so put yourself in harm's way and potentially lay down your life and you know about that more than anybody larry you've been involved in many line of duty situations this is a job that is much bigger than just figuring out where you can get the best paycheck or in a volunteer service, what volunteer house gives you the most whatever, right? I like, agree. And what I worry about is, is that that foundational, functional, important getup that we all buy into is changing. And when Mrs. Smith can't trust in us anymore because now all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm working here because it's my 48. I, I decided to work here because I make more pay here. And my life is so good right now. And then all of a sudden, bang, Wednesday morning, you get thrusted upon to go vent enter, search a building or, or search the floor above a fire. And you're going to put yourself in great harm's way, in great danger to make sure that that building is searched or Mrs. Smith that's laying on the floor upstairs is going to be pulled out and she believes you're coming. I have a hard time believing that if you're not ate up and it's not who you are, when it's time to go, you might not go anymore. All right. You said a lot. And let me unpack a bit. I know I did. I know. I was unpacking it in my brain. I hear you. Go ahead. 
you said something that scares the crap out of you right now, right? It, it, is how y'all are evolving in the Northeast in, in sure. with your frame of reference. There's two things firemen hate, right? The status quo and change. Right. And so that's automatically going to create apprehension. How do you combat that when you said, is that is that guy that's only here for his 48, is he, when it's time to go, is he going to go? If there's one thing that I can say that I'm extremely proud of about the fire service writ large, the new generation that buys into it, bro, they buy into it. I mean, they are full tilt boogie about being firemen. And it is so rewarding to see the passion. I mean, the Joey D this year in the Woodlands, you know. But those are the those are the ones I don't question. I agree, but hang on. But how do you get generations to drag themselves forward? You take those and you use them as incubators. And if they're the ones that will rise to the top and take those next level supervisor positions, right? They're driven, they're motivated, they have skill sets. They will be the ones that will drag the fire service forward and keep it in good hands. I have faith in that. What they have to do is find a way to communicate to their other people in their generation and get them on board with it. How does the organization help? Culture. And how is culture? It's from the top down, right? Some people will tell you you build it from the bottom up as long as there's not any impediments or stove piping. But when you get down to it, it still comes down to culture. The culture of the organization has to be one to where people want to come to work there. They want to do their job. They know they're not going to be messed with. They know that if they mess up, they're going to hear about it and be held accountable. But at the end of the day, they don't need a pat on their butt every time they do something good. But you create that environment where everybody – when I walk in the fire station, if I hear laughing and joking – it's going to be a good day. Yeah, it's going to be a good day. No doubt. Absolutely. No doubt. You know, and if they're messing with each other, if they're talking noise about some whatever topic, you know if that happens more often than not, you're doing something right or something is, is going right on its own. The guys in my department and me, we've said it before. We have no idea how we have transitioned how we have. We've been lucky. The stars have lined up, whatever. But I firmly believe it's because we have the right people. We have the right people that unknowingly – gelled and had common vision everybody bought into it and i think that you really can't put your finger on how how we've been successful with that no but it makes sense you know the culture the the people match the culture the culture matches the people people flock to good places get good people absolutely that's it but the culture can't be something it's a living breathing thing it can agree overnight i agree it can improve overnight it can go downhill overnight so, we, so have, here's, we have to look at the stimuluses that cause that and either support them if they're good or remove them if they're bad. I got roasted by people that said, it's just a job. It's a paycheck. My family and kids come first. Sure. I don't have a problem okay. with the philosophy about family and children come first. But when I don't, you're there, you got to be there 100%. I, oh, I agree. Right? I agree. My concern becomes when the focus is taken off of the job and the importance of the job and the all-in attitude on the job, and it just becomes a paycheck or a thing they do. When it's time to go, I'm starting to doubt that many will go. I haven't reached that tipping point where I fear that. I don't think we're there on a grand scale, but I can promise you this, and you know for a fact we saw it with some of the active shooter things with police departments delaying their response and going in, taking responsibility to go and, and make hostage rescues sure. or, or neutralize the situation. So how many day, how many times on the fire ground do we have people that are not putting themselves in positions, but you know what? At the end of the day, got away with that one today. Probably won't have to face a situation like that for another couple months. So, But now take it a step further. It's becoming grander. We used to have one guy in the department, two guys in the department that always had a mask problem or or just, or, oh, oh God, I'm having a, a, I'll be there in a minute. You know, can't be in a position that they're supposed to be in. And we can compensate for that. To a point. To a point. Yeah, but everything... Everything runs its course, and at some point, you run up against a wall to where you can't compensate for it. Larry, I want to be, I want to feel like, I want to feel like everybody out there is doing it for the right reasons. I want this romantic, I want this romantic sense about the you fire want a service. Norman Rockwell painting. I do. Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. Main Street USA with the fire truck half out of the bay being washed. Dalmatian. I 
love that because I grew I I grew up on that. Uh, so did I. But I want how do so my my concern is is how do I continue that love for the fire service and preach that or not pre I hate preach or how do I uh, how do I take that image and instill it into every single person I can touch in the fire service and let them understand that this is so much bigger than them. It's not about you. We say it all the time. Right. And it's like, I think over time, it's become a cliche statement. But the problem is today, there's more pushback against that than ever. Okay, who you got roasted by. And where they said, they're, I agree 100%. Families, number one. I, I get that. I don't take exception. I don't have a problem with it. I would venture to say, and I don't know this for a fact, because I don't know who, who was doing the roasting. Uh, but I would venture to say that the people that have that mindset come from potentially high probability come from an organization that has that left, shit all over them. Absolutely. I agree with you. Absolutely. That if you, if they, the people that are roasting you don't come from a place where they are happy with their employer or how they're treated by their employer. And, that speaks to the bigger picture a moment ago of where culture and if organizationally you support your people, then that's important. But what are we doing? Fast forward to the next step. We're not preparing people because all this, everything you see online, everything at the seminars, how many of them are talking about this is where I screwed up being an officer. This is where I screwed up being a chief. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the bang yourself on the chest. This is how we push down the hallway. Man, I took the bulkhead and I got an eight by eight. Okay, great. But at the end of the day, we're, we're doing the feel-good, low-hanging fruit stuff. We're not preparing anybody by telling them the trials and tribulations that we've experienced. And trust me, you know me. I've had mine. And to where, how do we pass that on to where those people don't fall in the same damn hot potholes that you not only fell into, but you dug yourself? You know, I mean, honestly, that's the part that just gets my blood boiling is that we are doing all the low-hanging fruit or we're doing the philosophical stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But we got a vacuum in the middle right that is not doing right shit. And that's the part that gets me. I mean, it's – I'm a firm believer. I will never, ever, ever ask somebody to do something I, ha I haven't done, can't do, or won't do. And, yeah, well, but, that's not where we are today. Well, that's the we problem. Gotta... But we're not <laughs> – I know. But we're not – That's to, to use your word, we're not spreading that. We're not making it the mm -hmm. cool thing. Now, if you can come up with a way to stand on stage and talk about that and convey that and then turn it into a cool video on social media, you might get traction. But it's not that high-speed, sexy sports car topic, but it's the one that will set these guys and girls up for failure or success moving forward. You know what's wild? More people today are seeking classes on leadership, culture, Leadership and culture than tactics, where tactics should be 90% of the conversation and leadership and culture be 10%. It's swapped. Culture and leadership, people seeking that is nine out of 10 times versus tactics. Are, right. We have flip-flopped the equation in the fire service because we have such terrible leadership. We have people that cannot lead, and we have disgruntled firefighters across this country we have departments that ask everything i'm doing it myself i just told you how romanticized i am about the fire service and i want everything from you i want everything from you i need everything from you to do this correctly i said that our fire departments say that but how many fire departments let their people down i expect everything from you as a firefighter we expect everything from you even laying your life down on the line I expect that from you. And in return, I'm not going to do shit for you. Well, let me give you a couple of examples. And I agree with you 100%. Yeah, that's the problem. I, I, I agree. And we're not the perfect organization. And I, by a damn stretch, I'm not the perfect fire chief. But when I walk in the door every day, my whole entire goal when I get in my city vehicle to go to the office is how do I not let the organization and the people down? Whether it's compensation, whether it's, and let's just take rig maintenance. And you and I have touched on this a while back. Sure. If you expect the guys to take care of the rigs, service them, clean them, know how they operate, check them out, make sure they're good to go. 
The administration has a responsibility to do their part, that when they write something up, it's addressed quickly. Because if not, that slippery slope, next thing you know, you got junk outside because they're not taking care of it because they don't think that you care to fix it. So letting the people down, everything we do, as John Salka says, focuses on a big red fire truck, right? Everything we do, the rig itself, the equipment on it, and the people we put on it. We cannot do our job unless we get on a big red fire truck. And if it doesn't start or can't get there, we can't do our job. So fundamentally, we have to we have to do our part administratively. And from a leadership perspective, you have to be willing to engage in those conversations because everybody has a boss, as one of my lieutenants always tells me. As a chief officer in particular, you have to be willing to go have those conversations with your board or your city manager or your mayor, depending upon how you're structured. And sometimes those are unpleasant. I've been there, done that. But if you stand on fact, if you stand on the good of the organization, and if you... I have heard so many times just in the last month, a fire chief says, I fought for my guys, but we didn't get anything. The guys need to see you fighting for them. That's right. If nothing else, my guys don't know half of the fights that I've had behind closed doors, but they've seen the ones that we've had publicly or disagreements. And at the end of the day, you have to be willing to do that. I'm not saying you slam your badge on, on, on the desk, uh, on any given topic, but we have to be willing to stand for the people if you expect them to stand for the organization. A hundred percent. Like that, that is what we need. The problem is, is we're letting our people down yeah. every single day. But do you know why? It's not, rom- oh, as you I- said, it's not romanticized. How, on Instagram today, and you've got a great social media presence. How, look and see how many of what's posted on Instagram is about tactics, rigs, fires, as opposed to leadership. There, there, there's one out there that, that I follow, a tip of the spear leadership. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them. I'm sure you are. Yeah, no, of course, yeah. They've got some good information, but it's, it's the small numbers, right? That's not the vast majority of what's out there. And again, back to generations, they're going to identify with what is readily available in their hand. And so if they can look at it on that, great. But if you go and have a Joey D lecture day, like we did this year, you know, how many of them are going to talk about leadership at that first company level officer uh, level or chief officer level? That's what we're not doing. You said earlier that it's flip-flopped. 90% of the requests for training now have to do with leadership. Well, look at it from a glass half full. That means that the skill set part has probably been ramped up and we're going and we're doing better at that. Because there was a while when that wasn't very good. Well, I don't know if it is. I think, you know, the the people that are, Larry, the circles we run in are. I agree. Totally agree. But, but it's a small subset of the fire service. The one thing I will say is over my years of travel now and doing what I do with National Fire Radio, I will say that what was once a subculture is becoming the culture. What was once abnormal is now becoming the normal, meaning... People do buy in. They want to better themselves. Their skill sets are better. Through technology and opportunity, we're able to educate better, Mm -hmm. give more opportunity for hands-on, more conferences than ever before. So that part of it, I agree, is there. I hope that everybody's skill set is sharper than it once was. However, they're seeking. They're just seeking what they're not getting. And I, I also think, too, I'm, I'm, just bear with me because my brain is spinning while we talk about this. The other problem, too, is we've become an immediate society. Mm-hmm. We get answers today in the immediate. There's no more bar trivia. There's no more arguing facts because all we do is Google it, Wikipedia, done. Yeah. We get your answers. We don't, we don't have conversation anymore about you know trivia because we just look it up and somebody ruins the conversation and we move on. We can get answers instantly today. Kids get answers instantly if they want to know why they can find out why very quickly today whereas years ago no you know you see the stupid thumbs up that happens on this like ai integration anyway so my point is this we're we're in a society of immediacy today anything you want is at at your fingertips Mm -hmm. so who has patience anymore to learn this job who has patience in the process who has patience to understand that it takes years and years 
of mastering this craft to become a good leader or a good boss or a good company boss. We want shortcuts today. We do. We, we are seeking shortcuts. But back to what I said when we first started this conversation, you can learn as much as you want, but until you do, you haven't done it. I agree. So what's the one common place where that leadership can be transferred as far as just by example and by just sheer immersion? It's in the cab of that fire truck as a starting point. If you just go to that focal point, if the rookie riding in the back, the new generation firefighter that, as you said, hasn't gone down that hallway yet, but if they are led by an officer who doesn't even, one of the best captains I ever drove for, for the one I drove for the longest, he didn't tell you this is what I do and why I do it. Right. He expected if you wanted to learn, you would pay attention. And again, he's one of the ones we're having dinner with tonight, so I can't wait to hear how his retired perspective is but about how the fire service has gone to hell in a handbasket. But when you get down to it, you saw by their decision-making, you saw by them being even-tempered, you saw how they handled uh, conflict, whether it be with another company, a citizen, or in our case, HPD. Uh, you, you saw how they handled themselves and carried themselves, how they were on the radio, how they wore their gear. All of that can be absorbed by example. It can be transferred by that. Then, as you are having that done riding on that fire truck with them, you're going down those hallways with them. You know, uh, you may have heard of a captain in Houston called Clifford, uh, named Clifford Reed. Yeah, Cliff, yeah, yeah, I've met him. There you go. Absolutely. The Reed Hood. Legend mm -hmm. in the Houston Fire Department. If social media would have been around 30 years ago like it is now, he'd be right up there with everybody in the national circuit. He was that legendary. And a matter of fact, he sent me an instant messenger last night. But I say all that to say he was that guy. When I made my first good rocket apartment fire, I'm with a legend. He literally walks up to me and he called everybody babe. He just patted me on the butt. He goes, you ready to go, babe? He exuded confidence. He exuded, I've been there, done that, we're going to be okay. And we had fire to the left, fire to the right. It was everywhere. It was all said and done. When we got done, he came out. He goes, Engine 10 can take upstairs. We've done our part. But he was calm, cool, and collected. And those are the things that you can learn by example. When you Yes, if, if, if that guy in the front right seat didn't have shortcuts to get there. Okay. You're... Okay. The guy, so understand, you said that the guy I drove the longest, he put his time in, though. Yeah. He did. He learned, he learned through experience. He learned from making mistakes. He learned by getting burned. He learned by getting his ass chewed out. He learned by having wins and successes. Right. But. That's the, pro the process. But, but. The process know, matters. I, I agree. But look at it as, uh, if you go to Sherwin-Williams and, and, and you get a paint chart, right, of different blues, right? And, and they change it in, in, in how deep or bright or vibrant they are. If you look at it, when he was a pipeman, he came up under hard-ass captains. Mm -hmm. And he learned how they functioned, how they mm -hmm. handled. And whether he knew it or not, he learned some of that. When he made captain, the people underneath him paid attention to that. There's nothing mm -hmm. that says that that six degrees of separation can't still have a benefit backwards. I hope. No, but... I think we have to look at it optimistically and reinforce it. There's been I love it. two big things in the fire service that people have been talking about for two years now, and it seems like the flavor of the week, right? It's relevant, but senior man, right? Everything's about the senior man now. All of a sudden, the senior man is some new epiphany that the fire service just figured out in the last two years. No, it's always <laughs> been there. If you would open your eyes and acknowledge it and realize the benefits. That and truck work. Everybody wants to be a truckie. But... Back to the senior man thing. The senior man thing, it's nothing different by learning from a senior man who passes it on or leads by example than by following and learning from an officer who passes it on by showing and leading by example. The, you can have that transfer of knowledge without it being spoken and needing a lesson plan and having to have the state approve it before you can have the class. That can take place on an informal basis in the fire truck, on the apparatus bay floor, or at the kitchen table. Some of the best, best times in terms of sharing of information was at the kitchen table. What we, what we were accustomed to and knew we take for granted. 
So a lot of us had senior men. Yep. We took them for granted. The reason why I think it's a popular topic today is because it's lacking. I would agree. No, the senior man exists. What I think is lacking is the senior men being willing. We said it all the time in the Houston Fire Department. <clears throat> when that man retires, 40 years of experience is going out the door and nobody is trying to harvest what he knows. We said it all the time. As long as we change our, to your point, our processes and our ability to retain that knowledge or have it passed on, dump it in a hard drive, then yes, then we're culpable in that. But the senior man has been around forever. We just haven't, it hasn't been the you know flavor of the month, but it's always been there and the people that recognize it have benefited from it. It's not like a new phenomenon, right? And the same we, with officers. Well, and we also need to have an environment that, that allows for the senior man to exist. Oh, no doubt. I've seen senior men get shut down by a brand new officer. But you know what? Senior men always get them back. I, 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 all, always is a strong word. But my, my point is, and what I'm doing with this conversation, I just want you to sense what I'm doing here. Everything I'm saying is not firmly what I believe in. What I'm doing is kind of pushing a little bit because I want to. I really want to dive in with you on this because these are important things. And, and so I just kind of want to take the other side of, of some of these conversations. But my point is, like, there's a lot of environments today that don't allow for the informal – uh, the informal professionalism to shine through because we have leaders today that lack their own knowledge and experience. And when you're not confident in your own skills and abilities, you're certainly not going to let anybody else flourish below you. Totally. And that is where I think we are today. We have a lot of that. I'm not, I'm not painting the fire service in a broad stroke. A lot of people are going to listen to this and be like, this is not the Jeremy we, we usually hear on the shows because usually I'm super optimistic. And, <laughs> and what, I, what, I'm doing, what I'm doing is saying there, there is a segment in the American fire service where the poor leadership that is in place are people that are, are holding their people back. Poor leaders don't endorse their people. Poor leaders hold, they pull the reins in to keep control. If you're a terrible leader, it's because you have to maintain control at all times because if it gets off the rails or you don't have control of the situation or whatever is at hand in front of you, when you're a weak leader, it gets out of hand very quickly and it shows how shitty of a boss you are. Mm -hmm. So the shittier the boss, the tighter the reins because that's how they keep control. And, and, and what's an example of when you have that? The perfect example, I swear it's across the entire country. When you, when that happens, what's the number one thing those types of bosses worry about? What? Uniforms. Oh, yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 Anybody right. who worries about uniforms, I don't care if my guys wear a t-shirt, a Class B, uh, shorts, 5'11", pants, whatever. Just as long as it says City of Stafford Fire Department on it and it's in good shape. I don't care. Because where the rubber meets the road is when the citizens call 911. I give the officers, hey, however you want to run your company, run it. Just make sure it's effective. We have very few discipline problems. If we do, we handle them informally at the back of the fire truck. Hey, man, what's the deal? Oh, well, this, this, and this. All right. You know better. And 99% of the time, it's addressed. That's what If you have a culture and structure in place that allows for that. There are firehouses that do not allow for that. Totally agree. There are entire departments, some very large yeah, yes, that don't do yes. that. But what Correct. you have to do is that for that to work, you have got to make those people comfortable, your personnel comfortable enough to, to know that if they own up to it, that it's going to be addressed and you move on and you don't hang it over their head for the next five years. That's yeah, I've seen God. that happen time and time again. Yes. Yeah, that is, that's the one thing to me that, that I just I struggle with, man, is like, we want our people to open up. We want our people to, to talk to us. We want our people, especially with all of this mental health and, you know, and, and focus on all of that. And then we tell them we have an environment that, 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 that is looking out for their betterment. And as soon as somebody allows themselves to be a little bit vulnerable, they never live it down. Sure. And God, I, and, and that, I took it to a serious place, but take it a few steps back. Take it to a guy that makes a mistake on the fire ground. Yeah. And we informally correct it, and we're like, "Good, we're gonna move on from here." And and then the next thing in his career, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, the next year, the next year, he 
you have to allow people to make mistakes and move on from it. But there's a you can bust if the guys bust balls on them. For- busting balls is not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about if the officer continues to keep holding it over his head in a formal fashion, that's wrong. Correct. If he keeps bringing it up in a belittling way. That's Correct. Wrong. Now, Correct. everybody's sitting around the kitchen table, and the guy right. that, and the offender from a month ago be, pops off. Be prepared. Yeah. You, you automatically Damn right. you shut him down. But right. it, it's one of those things where we have to be willing to let the guys make mistakes, but be there to catch them. And when something happens, absolutely, the organization has to circle the wagons to protect the organization. You own up on your screw-ups, and we figure out a way to deal with it. That has to permeate the organization top to bottom. It cannot just be this rank down here, that's how we handle it. This rank up here, we do something different. And I know departments that have entire file cabinets with three padlocks on them for all the you know, OIG crap. You're like, really? What's the relevance of it? Yeah. People are going to screw up. Hell, I screw up yeah, on a daily what? basis. <laughs> And what does that message send? It, right? Yeah. It's a culture of secrecy, of yeah. you know, vindictiveness, of just always tracking people down or, or always wanting to, to hold something over their heads. And, I, you know, and you said something a little while ago, but people revert back to their comfort level, right? No matter how far up the chain of commands you go, you revert back to your comfort level. That's another, t- besides uniform policies, that's another telltale sign when somebody is outside of their depth. When somebody automatically, who's supposed to be wearing a white shirt, riding around in a buggy, when the first thing he wants to do is get out of the car and pick up a hose line, he's probably two, pe- two tests past where he should be. And I don't say that critically or, or offhandedly, but I've seen it be true. When you've got a truck captain and all that captain and all that officer wants to do is go pick up a hose line, you can't do that. That's not your job anymore. You promote it up to here. But it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means they're not comfortable in that role yet. And some people never get comfortable in that role. And if they don't get comfortable in the role, that's when what you said happens. They hold their people back. I know an entire fire department that could be the best fire department on planet Earth. No exaggeration. All the money in the world. Great rigs. Phenomenal facilities. They just got a leash on them. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard to work that way. Career or volunteer, it's hard to work that way. You know, right. it's it's you want your people to come in, you want your people to feel comfortable, you want your people to feel empowered. And you know, when you work or volunteer for an organization that is holding their people back, you have nothing but you're you're trending downward. There's never gonna be success coming out of an organization like that. We need leaders that are excited, encouraged to push their people to want to drive the organization to be better. And, um, and that, that is how you get the buy-in. And I, I just, I can't stress that enough. And I, I, I you know, I want to say like, and the problem is too, and I, the problem is, is anybody that's going to listen to this episode? <laughs> right. Probably not. They're not. Well, no, but what I'm getting at is people are going to listen to this. But the, the point is, the people that listen to this aren't the ones that need to hear this. Oh, no doubt. Because the people that gravitate to, to your platform, I totally agree. They're the ones that want to become better. I want to become better. You want to become better. I mean, there's different ways to, to, to do it. And you're right. It's just like the people that go to the Joey D in the Woodlands. Those are the people I that hope, want to be there. You know, my daughter joined the volunteer house uh, a couple months a couple months ago. Yeah. Really cool. Um I talked about it a little bit. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to feel about it, to be honest with you. I was I was very conflicted. She had never told me leading up to her 16th birthday that she wanted to join. Uh, so it kind of caught me out of left field. Um, and I was like, oh, it's great. It's great. And then when I thought about it, I was like, man, I don't, I don't really know how I feel about this. Right. Um, it's my place. It's in my... It's it's my it's been my place for thirty years. It's my separation. It's my getaway. It's my enjoyment. It's my passion. It's it's all these things. And now I have to share this with my daughter. Yep. And I I had to put a lot of thought into it about like what it all looked like. And I'm not even looking at the. It was a selfish look for me because it, I wasn't even worried about her safety or putting herself in harm's way. It was more of a conversation about my selfishness of do I want her there? Do I want her exposed? Yeah, this is my sandbox. 
right? Do I want to share this? Yeah. And then now it's my daughter? Like, that's even, am I going to? And so I had to wrestle with that, but it, I got over it very, very quickly because I realized that the guy that I am there is the same guy that I am at home. Exactly. And in fact, um, you know, I, I know today that she looks at me very differently than she did just a few months ago. And her and I have a very different relationship today than I do with, than I do, than I did with her before, let alone my own family. And, and I had a really interesting conversation with her uh, a couple, like a month in. I said, listen, I said, what, what's going to happen here is, is very different than what you're accustomed to. I said, um, you and I are now on a different level. You and I share something that I don't share with anybody else in our family. I said, you're going to see things that you shouldn't see. You're going to hear things you shouldn't know. I said, all these things are going to happen, but they stay there. We can talk about it, you and I. But we don't bring it home. We don't talk right. about it at the kitchen table. You and I are going to share looks at each other that we understand and, and acknowledge something that nobody else in our family is going to understand. Yeah. I said, you and I are on a much different level than anyone else today. And I said, and, and, and so she took that to heart, which was really cool because it was a, it was a pretty tough conversation to have with her. But to, to, for a 16-year-old girl to sure. you know, wrap her head around. But, man, I'll tell you this. Like, she looks at me today differently than she did. In a good way? Just a few months. Yeah. yeah. Like, like she understands why my passion is what it is today. Right. She sees me at the firehouse. She sees the respect I have for the fire service and the dedication I have to it. She sees the relationships I have with the individual. She knew all the guys. You know, my kids grew up there, so they knew everybody. But now that she rides with us, it's a whole different story than just being, you know, Jay's kid, right? Like, totally different. You know what you just um, described? And, go ahead. You just described what I've been saying you learn on a fire truck from an officer to a rookie. Yeah. You're just doing it with your yeah. daughter. You don't even realize yeah. you're doing it. She well, I do. I do because I'll tell you why. And this was the point of the story. And this is why I'm, I'm it's funny you said that, but that's exactly why I'm telling you the story. Fast forward a few months later, I find myself more excited about the fire service than I've been in a very long time when it comes to running on the trucks. I'm, a, I'm more one of the senior guys in the fire, most senior active guys probably there uh, other than one or two guys. So a lot of times I end up chauffeuring, like driving the engine, right? And, and if we go to fires and we're not first due, then, yeah, I get to put a pack on and go to work. Now I'm removing myself from that position. I'm riding in the back seat a lot more because for me – I feel like today she's not going to get the same experience I got when I started. It's a different firehouse today. Well, and if I'm not, yeah, what's that? I said the frequency of fires have gone down. Well, that too, but it's the whole experience. It's in a volunteer house, right? A home response, right? It's after the call, you sign in, bullshit for five minutes, out the door. Where years ago, you used to stay for a half hour, 45 Please. minutes. We used to break something off the truck. We used to do a beer. We used to do this. Yep. So that's where the learning was. There was a lot of learning in that, but today we don't have that structure in place like we used to. And so for me, I realized that if I want my daughter to do this, um, I have to make sure that she has the same experience and exposure that I had to it. And I didn't feel like she was going to get that if I was just going to be that guy sitting up front as a senior guy in the engine now, just driving the engine. And who's in the back seat talking with her, talking her through it, educating her? Probably nobody. You know, and, and so you want to make sure that that knowledge transfer is a correct knowledge transfer that and also that she gets real exposure to it and she doesn't become jaded because the experience isn't as good as it could be because we're not committed to giving such a good experience anymore. Let me ask you this. Uh, yeah. At her age, is she allowed to go interior? No. OK. No. So in New Jersey, it's uh, 16 to ride. 18, uh, you finish. So she can start the academy and go through all the classroom stuff and I think even do some hands-on stuff. But then she has to. She can't do any of her live burn stuff until 18. And then uh, 18, you could be certified as an interior firefighter by us. So she's got two years of exposure and, and learning it and so on. But, you know, for me, though, I look at it and I go, man, if I'm doing that for my daughter... And I recognize that the experience isn't the same today that as, as the experience was that I got when I was young, right? How many other guys got gypped out of a great experience? Yep. You know, you think about how many guys, even in the career fire department, how many guys go through the fire academy, there's all these promises made, they get to a shitty firehouse, and they fall out of love with it because they were never given the opportunity to fall in love with it. Take it back one step further. They get hired on with the career department, and what they're actually taught at the academy is just a checkbox shit 
Well, we can go down. I, yeah. I'd love to go down that road. Yeah. And you actually make a bad situation even worse because then they go to a slow station with, with, with people that don't want to do anything. Nothing pisses me off more. We're having it with our academy right here, and I'm happy to talk about it because I don't care. I'm so frustrated with the process. We have terrible, jaded instructors who haven't ridden a fire truck, and I couldn't tell you how many years, that are doing checkbox fire academy bullshit. Their egos are in the way. They're doing, this is how you test, but I'm going to show you my way. Our students are getting confused. They don't get it, but at the end of the day, they're told, don't worry about it, because when you go back to your firehouse, they're going to show you how to do it anyway. Then they come, and then how many kids go back to a shitty firehouse, and there's no foundation for them to learn. So whatever the checkbox bullshit was, an ego-driven training they just got, Mm -hmm. that's all they know. Well, then why do they? We are failing. We are failing at that every single day. I agree. And I think you've got some exemplary academies that set their people up for success, even in combination in volunteer settings uh, or in career settings. And I think you have others that are less than where they need to be. But, you know, those that are less than they need to be or should be, why aren't they being dealt with? Yes. Right. Now, I don't know how, how, how your academy is structured or whatnot, but it seems like, you know, Everything in the fire service now you pay a small fortune for, right? And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's affiliated with fire rescue, it's going to be four times more than it should. And so when you get down to it, what are they paying for a sub, not necessarily you, but anywhere, what are you, what are you paying for a substandard checkbox, you know, training program that you have to redo the right way when they get to your house anyway? Right. And it's not only that, but here's the thing, right? Like, yeah. let's, let's just have a real conversation. Any organization still has unbelievable people in it, right? So I'm not saying, I'm not sitting here saying that the training academy is failing. Right. What I am saying is there are people there that need to be removed. Gotcha. And there needs to be accountability within the process to say, this guy should not be a guy leading a fire one class. We should be putting younger, dynamic instructors into the introduction program to the fire service where they're instilling excitement and energy into the program to get these kids to buy in to the fire service. And instead, we're putting jaded, outdated shitbags that were shitbags in their career and they're shitbags at the academy. Right. And those guys now are the introductory uh, instructors that are going to introduce the next generation to the fire service who are jaded and against them to begin with because they don't like who they are to begin with. And we're going to put them at the forefront of a fire one class. What the fuck are we doing? Is there any feedback that's provided by the students on their instructors? In this one case, the instructor just got removed. That's how bad it's been. No, but but what I'm saying is do the students at the end of a module or at the end of the Academy, do they get to write reviews on the course instruction of their instructors? I don't know that, to be honest with because, you. I don't know if they get to do that. That's a good way to kind of – if you're getting the job done the right way, that's a good way to fine-tune things. But <sighs> if it's gotten to that point and they're not willing to remove people – There's a level of intimidation, for Christ's no sake. No doubt. It's wild. Yep. You think an 18-, 19-year-old kid that, that signed up for his volunteer fire department goes to the academy and gets treated like a piece of garbage from a senior fireman – is going to speak out against them? Right. Oh, what are we doing? And you get labeled quickly. God damn. God. I get so, I'm, I'm so angry about it because you look at, we are hungry for people to fall in love with the process. We're hungry for firefighters. We want to excel and grow our base. Yeah. And then we have our own people just chasing people out. No doubt. It's unbelievable. Yep. And, you know, but that comes with, you know, arrogance, entitlement. Pick your pick your poison. I don't know, brother. I don't know. I I love this. I mean, this this is the stuff. These are the conversations that I love having. I love getting passionate about it. Got you a little fired up before. It's good, you know. But I it's this this is what I think we need to have. We need to have more of this. I agree. This, you know, spirited discussion. Um, you know, I'm toying with this uh, National Fire Radio open house forum Uh-oh. where it's like myself and two or three guys oh, are shit. up on the screen and we send out the link to the webinar so people can be in the in the audience and and then just come on. What's your question? Let's go. Where do you want to go with this? And then we just like ping pong 
back and well, forth on you it. You did some of that on Clubhouse that one time. I know that we did, and there was one about roof ventilation because Shawnee. Yeah. And and then Dugan and I got a, Captain Dugan and I kind of got into it about vertical yes. on a pitched roof. I love it. Which I still think is a viable tactic. Just because people in your part of the world don't want to do it. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Time out. That is one jurisdiction. Oh, I, That's hear you, it. I hear you. It's one jurisdiction. The thing is this, though, right? You know what nobody talks about vertical ventilation, not to go off on a tangent, but we talk about we talk about heat, smoke, fire. No, we don't talk about popping a roof because I remember during that conversation, it was like, well, you cut a hole in a peaked roof. You're going to poke down. You know, everybody's got shit in their attic and, you know, people have plywood decking and you're never going to get through to the second floor or the floor below. You're just going to ventilate that space. Nobody ever talks about pressure. Oh, I agree. Like when, when you ventilate a building, you're relieving pressure within. The byproducts of the, 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 what has created the pressure is the heat, the smoke. Right. And the in the in the byproducts of fire create pressure in the building. So when you alleviate pressure, it's not just lifting heat. You might not be able to expose the the interior compartments of the building. You might just be relieving that pressure within the attic space. But that overall betters but the conversation. If you look at positive pressure ventilation. That's how it works. It increases the atmosphere that's correct. pressure inside of a given space and pushes it out through an exit to a space that has a lower atmospheric pressure. It isn't rocket science, but vertical ventilation, if you got an attic fire, you ain't got to push shit down. Uh, but I, I totally, in the Houston Fire Department, we've always done vertical ventilation regardless of the room. Sure. Uh, again, I think it's a cultural thing, uh, and I like to give Captain Dugan a hard time about it. Uh, not to say that he hadn't been on one or 300 roofs in his lifetime, uh, but, you know, it, it's just one of those things, and you make a valid point about the pressure. But – have, have you ever have you ever experienced vent point ignition on a vent? Yeah, dude, it's it's lighting off four feet above the roof line for a reason. <sighs> it's because of the increased pressure that you just released. That's right. Yeah, it's, that's right, man. It's not doing it just because the amount of that friction coming out against the hole that you just cut, man. Oh my god, it's wild. Uh, I posted some yeah. stuff on social media a month or two ago. We were getting our asses kicked on the second floor. We couldn't raise our hand up, and I shit you not, as soon as the truck cut the hole, light switch. No exaggeration. It was, it was a thing of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can go down this road, oh, too, yeah. but we're not going to. We're not going nope. to. But listen to me. Larry DiCamillo, thank you. I know you and I have been talking about doing some things together. Uh, I, do, I do truly enjoy your perspective and points of view because you're, you're not afraid to share your opinions. Um, and I think that that's super important, um, and we need that because we need leaders in the fire service to be able to speak their mind and, and talk about uh, you know topics that need uh, that need some conversation around. I agree. Um, yeah, so the I, opportunity. Yeah, man. As always. So listen, thank you. Um, don't go anywhere. Let me just sign off this episode, and uh, it's not even an episode. I mean, we literally just hit record. As you and I, this would be a phone call between you yep. and I. So we might as well record them, right? Well, but now so, I can call you Jay. You said I could. Yeah, there you go. You're in. You're in that inner circle I now. Call you Jay. Welcome to the party. <laughs> Beautiful. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Another episode of National Fire Radio Podcast for Larry D. Camillo, a good friend of mine out of the Texas. I'm Jeremy with National Fire Radio. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks for tuning in. National Fire Radio.